External debts are often known for their role in driving an economy into bankruptcy. From time and time again throughout the developed and developing world, external debt has played this role by being overused and mismanaged by various governments worldwide. But as modern fiscal practices continue to improve, external debt, a key instrument of this entire modern economy, has paved the way for many countries to flourish when managed properly. Amongst the largest external debt holds around the world, hails from a nation in the middle of Southeast Asia, a tiny island nation that is also commonly known as Singapore. Singapore today is one of the world's financial centers. It houses the richest Asians and is a glamorized economy. Its external debt, however, is often attributed to its economic rise, but also misunderstood. According to the latest data, it is estimated that its gross external debt is said to be more than 2.4 trillion Singaporean dollars, or approximately 1.7 trillion US dollars. At first, it may seem insane, since 1.7 trillion US dollars is a figure that is more than most countries' nominal gross domestic product, and more than its neighboring country, Indonesia's GDP. Furthermore, for a country with no more than 733 kilometers worth of an area and a population of just around 5.4 million, it would sound as if Singapore's economy would collapse any moment due to its overwhelming amount of external debt. What is even more is that the country's annual economic output is estimated to be just around 400 billion US dollars, which may then imply the question, how can Singapore have so much external debt? At 1.7 trillion US dollars, this makes Singapore's external debt to be higher than that of the external debt of India, a country with around 620 billion US dollars, Russia's at 489 billion US dollars, and even higher than that of Indonesia, which has 415 billion US dollars. These three even collectively still have less external debt than Singapore. Yet as we all know, these three nations individually have economies larger, way larger than Singapore. Well, to put everything out very simply, it is because Singapore stands today as one of the world's financial hubs, and these external debts as calculated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore are the collective of both public and private debt of the country. Meaning the entire $1.7 trillion debt owed by the entire country comes from the government and private companies. And these debts owed can be from a foreign entity as well, which is a government or a private corporation, and they can come from an individual foreign resident. This brings us to where the majority of Singapore's external debt is coming from, which is tied to the country's private corporations, and mostly from its banking sector. External debt takes into account international deposits made into Singapore. For example, if a person from, say, the United States or China would come to the island nation to open up a bank account of their own and deposit $1,000, these would eventually be registered into the overall external debt of the country. This is the role of external debt that has driven Singapore's figures to be very high. Deposit-taking corporations are estimated to be over 1.5 trillion Singaporean dollars, or 1.05 trillion US dollars. This is again a figure that shows how profound Singapore has become as a destination for foreign deposits. It has been amongst the best places in the entire world to store wealth. Some entities have even chosen Singapore as their place to store their money, more than their home country. Some of the reasons why they had chosen Singapore is due to its secure and stable banking industry. The Southeast Asian nation has never seen a monetary bankruptcy from its banking industry. Moreover, the country is also being sought after for tax purposes and banking secrecy. But anyway, besides its external debt being composed of mainly international deposits, where is the remaining 700 billion US dollars coming from? Well, it is divided across numerous segments, from direct investments for intercompany loans, which is estimated to be 270 billion US dollars. This is a term that is used to indicate when a company loans their money to another. Another factor is debt securities, which is 92 billion US dollars, and is used as an instrument where one entity can purchase from another entity, such as government bonds, corporate bonds, and so on. These are just among the remaining external debt of Singapore, which is not registered due to its foreign deposits. And do note that there are a lot more on the entire list. One thing we have yet to mention is that Singapore's government's external debt is zero, meaning all of the external debts directed towards the country are held by private companies, which can easily tell us that there is no risk involved with the country's use of external debt. Singapore's government is the one that issues debts to other countries. The country is known for its international debt market. And within the entire Southeast Asian region, the island nation is even responsible for 60% of the project financing seen across the 10 nations. These are often known to be in the form of loans or investments and are sought after to either help their neighbors or to generate income investments back into their homeland. 
So what makes Singapore a grand destination as a financial hub? Well, before we even answer that, Singapore has been a financial hub for decades now. But the most recent available data has shown that since 2003, Singapore has held hundreds of billions of deposits worldwide. Growing from 660 billion Singaporean dollars to over a trillion dollars by 2008, only to fall quite a bit due to the 08 and 09 financial collapse, which crushed billions of dollars off of the world economy and impacted even Southeast Asia's best managed economy. It would only be until 2013, however, that Singapore would again see over a trillion dollars worth of deposits, which would continue to rise until today. To answer why Singapore became one of the world's financial hubs, and why people choose the island nation over the likes of Hong Kong, London or Switzerland, well, numerous answers could be easily attributed. But from how we see it, it is because they had done everything perfectly. Singapore is arguably the most advanced country in the entire world. We can point it to the country's technology capabilities, but also the country's financial and business hubs. But for simplicity's sake, it is due to Singapore's renowned business policies, where transparency is everything. They have a stable and strong law and political framework, a profound national wealth, and most importantly a destination for international companies. This is an important thing that also plays into Singapore's overall status. Singapore is home to global corporations, and startups across Southeast Asia, India, to Western nations have chosen Singapore as its destination for financial dealings, for headquarters, for a regional office, and even as an entrance to the big market that Southeast Asia offers. Not only that, but Singapore also holds a very favorable corporate tax environment, which is not only seen across Southeast Asia but the world. Singapore's taxation system is among the lowest in the entire world. Though tax purposes are not the sole reason why foreigners choose Singapore, the island nation also holds numerous policies on tax networks from country to country, and good diplomatic treaties, which all help shape Singapore to become a destination for international headquartering. This is why Singapore is number one in the entire world when it comes to doing business. But do not limit the list to these fiscal policies alone, since Singapore is just built up from one sector to another and has eventually paved the way for its name today. But let us not limit ourselves, however, that everything is glitz and glamour. Singapore indeed is good for business, for all these deposits and investments, but they're not entirely good for the home countries of their investors. Take for example the startup that turned into billion dollar business Grab Super App, or simply Grab. It was founded in Malaysia, but due to Singapore's stance as a more favorable destination for Grab to operate in, the company eventually moved its headquarters to Singapore. Had Grab stayed in Malaysia as its base for operations and its executives, we think that the business would not have flourished to where it is today. Since Singapore has provided more incentives to the company rather than staying in Malaysia. While these statements could be argued, it is without a doubt that Singapore still played a massive role in growing companies. Furthermore, the country's taxation system is consistently being leveraged to maximize the profit of one's company, a factor that is being sought after by global companies. For example, what would happen to Grab if a competitor, say Gojek or Uber, had more favorable tax payments than Grab? Well, exactly, we think that it would be hard for them to compete. The same could be said for almost every company competing globally. However, sometimes due to this, the country has been classified as a tax haven. This concept in Singapore for tax purposes may also have to do something about its entire external debt. A lot of Singapore's external debt, as we noted earlier, comes from foreign depositories. According to numerous publications, such as one known as the Financial Secrecy Index, Singapore is among the top leading destinations for offshore capital. It holds approximately one-eighth of the world's offshore capital, which suggests that all these so-called international deposits to foreign offshore vehicles may not all be clean. Numerous fallacies occurred in the past, and while we may not know it, some of them may still be operating today. But do take note, however, that while we did suggest Singapore has a massive role through its external debt, they're not the only country around the world that holds the same stance, which is led by its international deposits. We have countries such as Switzerland to the United Kingdom, and also other smaller countries such as Malta and Ireland. Singapore may just be the only one that has become unique, since it is a country that is strategically located in Southeast Asia, which may suggest that as wealth rises in its region and East Asia, the future of the island nation would be far better off. But anyway, most of what we've mentioned thus far does not hold the entire answer to the massive story of Singapore's external debt as a financial hub and other fallacies. The complexity of Singapore is huge, and this should only play out as one of the many other stories out there. Anyway, what do you think?